been a big part of. Uh, diarrhea deaths, uh, pneumonia deaths also went down, and that's because Gavi took some vaccines uh -huh. that were being given to middle-income and rich country children who were at very low risk of dying from those diseases. Still a good thing, but actually the kids who had 10 times the risk uh -huh. were not getting the vaccines, and it's by buying the vaccines through Gavi that now our coverage on rotavirus <clears throat> and pneumococcus <clears throat> is actually quite uh, high, and so that's why that uh, acceleration took place. So and we're lucky enough to have the director of the Global Fund and Gavi here today. I want to start with you, Peter, to now that we've seen what's possible with investment and with focus and with using the tools that we've learned over the last 20 years, what, what are the immediate and urgent challenges? What, what happens if we don't uh, focus on these things? Well, I think the starting point, as Bill said, is that the Global Fund and Gavi have been two financial innovations for global health that have actually worked extremely well mm -hmm. and have delivered a massive difference in terms of lives saved. The challenge is going forward. Well, the job's not over. And Gozi can talk um, on the vaccination side, but suddenly with AIDS, TB, and malaria, um, we've roughly speaking halved deaths in AIDS and malaria and about 20% reduction in TB. But if we really want to achieve the sustainable development goal ambition of ending the epidemics by 2030, we have to step up the fight. We have to do more, better. That's not just about money, it's innovation, it's collaboration, it's better execution, better use of data, but it also takes more money. Which is why, as Bill mentioned, our replenishment is this year, the way the replenishment works in the Global Fund is it's a three-year cycle, so we're raising money for the next three years, and we're saying we need at least $14 billion. And for those of you from the private sector, we want at least a billion dollars of that to come from the private sector um, to fund the next three years of the Global Fund's work. Now, why is it so challenging? Well, resistance is a problem across all three diseases, most potently and obviously with MDR, um, TB, multi-drug resistant TB, but also with mosquitoes <coughs> becoming resistant to um, bed nets. We also face um, the way the epidemics work has changed. I mean, the, the most likely person now to be catching HIV is an adolescent girl. And the root causes of the high rates of infection around adolescent girls and young women in southern and eastern Africa in particularly are a horrible cocktail of all the gender inequalities you can think of, from sexual, um, sexual violence to economic disadvantage, educational disempowerment. And we are finding that we are having to work in different ways with different partners to address that challenge. Malaria, tale of two areas. We've got some countries making great progress towards elimination, but the highest burden of countries, frankly, we're doing enough to save lives. We're not doing enough yet to break the transmission cycle. The numbers of cases are not coming down fast enough. And on, and on TB, well, frankly, we will all regret it if we don't meet the challenge of MDR TB. So it, and the other issue, of course, is emerging threats. And, and Gosi, you know, we've had a really remarkable in stark example of what happens when these partnerships work in the case of Ebola in May. There was an outbreak of Ebola virus in Ecuador province in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the nonprofit world, Gavi, uh, the, the state governments, the, the, uh, the World Health Organization um, under Dr. Tedros, um, uh, and, all, and Merck um, and other uh, private companies worked together, created a ring vaccination, stopped it with a small number of deaths, and it never left the area. Later that summer, we've now seen a new outbreak in Kivu province where it's in a war-torn region and some of these partnerships can't get the job done. It's just too difficult. And we're now at a place where hundreds of people have, have either confirmed cases of the disease and 400 plus have died and there's no sign of it alleviating. In fact, it seems to be accelerating. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, given the role that you have played in coordinating all of these stakeholders, you know, that challenge, that's, I mean, that's the perfect example of when it works versus when it doesn't, the threat. 
Well, let, let me thank you. I think Gavi is that new modern type of organization uh, that we all want to achieve, mm -hmm. where you have an alliance that brings together partners, mm -hmm. um, you know, that can work together in collaboration to tackle a given problem. So that alliance has WHO in it, it has UNICEF, mm -hmm. um, uh, it has the World Bank, it has pharma, pharmaceutical companies, so we have private sector at the table, we have civil society, and we also have the beneficiary uh, countries around the table. So it's a unique partnership where you're coming together. And I think that's the modern type of cooperation we need to solve problems these days. So when you talk about Ebola, uh, Dr. Tedros was in the field. Uh, he took the lead with WHO uh, to go and try and see the problems firsthand. He went with Seth Berkeley, the CEO, of Gavi, um, uh -huh. and I think because we uh, had taken this step of trying to stockpile some of these uh, experimental uh -huh. Ebola vaccines, uh, there was something available. So when you say it's a failure, this, I don't quite agree with you. Uh -huh. I think if we hadn't had that, it would have been much worse. But I'll leave Dr. Tedros to, to talk about that because he was actually there on the ground. <laughs> well, please jump in. So, so, yeah. so yeah, I could, yeah, yeah, you know, no. So I just want to say that the alliance, I think, worked. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud because mm -hmm. it could have been much worse. You know, when you have conflict, that's one of the challenges we face, that in mm -hmm. reaching people where there's conflict is, is a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's one that we are trying to overcome. But it's not easy because mm -hmm. people's lives are in danger. But Dr. Tedros mm -hmm. can say more. I was a member of Gavi board, and I know the alliance works. I saw it when I was health minister, and now I see it as director general of WHO. Mm -hmm. um, and as Ngozi said, I, I was there three weeks ago, uh, during the new year actually, and it was uh, for me a very emotional uh, time uh, to share a meal with my colleagues uh, fighting Ebola in uh, DRC, in the front line. <laughs> we could see to what extent they're uh, putting their life on the line. Mm -hmm. Even when we were there on New Year's Day, uh, one of the Ebola vaccine responders, vaccinators, we're talking about vaccine, was attacked mm -hmm. and he, he sustained head injury. And myself and uh, Jeremy were in the field. Uh, Jeremy, the Wellcome Trust director, and luckily he's a neurologist and uh, he helped <laughs> the um, mm -hmm. patient uh, to not only stabilize, but using the helicopter we had, we had to evacuate him. Uh -huh. um, and that was really a very humbling moment. To what extent, you know, our colleagues there are uh, facing uh, daily uh, challenges and um, serious uh, dangers, actually, uh, to keep uh, others uh, safe. Uh, so um, then coming to the vaccine, uh, I told you about the story about uh, Charles uh, Mwenga, the, the guy, uh, because of uh, the vaccination, the vaccine, because he was vaccinating when he was attacked, actually. Uh, and then the other side is, um, so far we have vaccinated 60,000. Mm -hmm. mm. And if it wasn't for the vaccine, we would have seen more cases. We have now around 650. Uh -huh. In five months, you cannot limit the spread of Ebola uh, in 650 without the vaccines. Uh -huh. And not only that, the <coughs> colleagues I spoke to in the field told me that in the eyes of the people affected by Ebola, we see hope, not fear. Uh -huh. But in 2014, during the uh, West Africa Ebola, it was fear everywhere, well, not only in the Ebola area, yeah. even yeah. <laughs> in everywhere, yeah. all over the world. So we are in a different situation, which is, which is really uh, important. And I think it's very important that we recognize the power of partnership, the power of alliance, the power of innovation and technology that helped us to be where we are. Mm -hmm. But when I say this, I'm not saying it's perfect, we're still very, very vulnerable to outbreaks, including to Ebola, and we have to build on the success we have already achieved. And Sonia, you're, you're seeing in, in Pakistan, you know, 
a, a shift, and not just obviously there are still the threat of infectious disease, but you're seeing non-communicable diseases, diseases that used to be most prevalent in the West um, and wealthier countries, and now you're starting to see them get, you know, grow with, with you know, a frenzy in some cases. Talk a little bit about how you manage those twin challenges. Well, the shift towards uh, non-communicable diseases being the predominant contributors to burden of disease is not just something that's happening in Pakistan. It's, it's a global trend. It's happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of financing for global health, we have to appreciate that non-communicable diseases are not just disruptive in the epidemiological sense of the damage they cause, because we all know that they are the biggest contributors to death, to disease, to disability. Mm -hmm. But they're also equally disruptive in terms of the uh, political, the economic, the societal and health systems responses needed to address the challenge. Now, if you look at country demand for technical assistance, and, and Tedros will bear me out on that, NCDs rank amongst the top three asks from countries. And in fact, when we were campaigning together two years ago, this was the consistent ask from, from, different, uh, from different countries. But as opposed to that, we know that it is not within uh, the realm of competencies of ministries of health and the existing uh, infectious disease partnerships that we've created to fully respond to the full range of determinants of non-communicable diseases. So it's quite an imperative to have the new, to have a new set of institutional competencies and financing instruments to deal with, uh, with non-communicable diseases. And I fundamentally believe that an appropriate response to non-communicable diseases could be revolutionary for public health, mm -hmm. just as the HIV response to HIV AIDS was, uh, the, you know, more than, more than a decade ago in terms of um, institutionalizing the right space approach to health and catalyzing the access to mm -hmm. medicines dialogue and um, including affected communities and the civil society in the planning process. Uh, I, I believe that an appropriate response to NCDs could actually change the rules of game uh, on two fronts. Firstly, this whole uh, aspect of uh, the whole of government approach and the multi-sectoral approach to dealing with public health. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, the, the, the whole piece around engagement with the private sector. So, so NCDs can be qu quite transformative in, in, in these respects. Well, that's a perfect segue to our last speaker, uh, who represents the private sector. Um, you know, Voss, you're unusual for a drug company CEO in a number of ways. One, you're a physician. But two, you're also a, uh, a practitioner of, of global health uh, care from your earliest days. You were at the WHO when you started. Um, you've had great experience in that. And, and thirdly, I think you're also a data geek. You're, you're a guy who, who really is looking at sophisticated ways to address these access issues and finding out where, you know, what drugs can work more effectively. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the tools that we've got to address some of these global health challenges from the private sector? You know, when I reflect, and I love the, the Steven Pinker charts because I think they put it all in, in perspective, yeah. you know, we as an industry are probably our greatest contribution is bringing innovations forward. And I think that's um, hopefully obvious to everyone here. When you look over that period, the 100 years at least, from 1900 to today, you have 1,500 enemies, you have over 20 vaccines that constitute what we talk about on this stage. And that was the industry bringing these technologies forward. And I think whether it's healthcare, water, energy, ultimately as, a, as the private sector, our ability to innovate on these problems, but then ultimately give access to the poorest of the poor is the conundrum that we yeah. face. That's really where we make our greatest contribution. We put forward $170 billion a year into R&D just in our, in our healthcare industry. And that R&D ultimately leads to innovations. I was recently as, as reflecting on it in, a, in Ghana and Gabon. If you go to a dispensary in those countries and you look at the, the list of drugs, you know, those, those lists of drugs were innovated just 15, 20 years ago, and now finally they've reached, um, you know, the farthest reaches of, of, of the planet. That's the problem I think we now need to be all about, which is access to medicines. You know, Gavi was founded on the premise that Prevnar, actually, our, our pneumococcal vaccines, took too long mm -hmm. to get to people. And we left that to Bill and, and Gavi to sort out. And I think we as an industry now have to be all about how do we bring our innovations within the first year or two of when we find them to reach 
all, 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 all populations on the planet. So I think that's actually where we create our greatest contribution. Now we, as an industry, I think we give $20 billion into various forms of corporate giving and donations. Um, I ask myself, is that well directed? Is that really having the impact it, it could? And I think that's an that's a, a open question. But if you ask me what the biggest impact we could have is if all that 170 billion of R&D to find the next innovation reaches that patient in Kenya or Botswana much faster, then we've had the impact that we want. So can, you brought up a really, yeah, just please. Just say a word, I, I yeah. hope you don't mind. I want you I to. can't yeah. resist, you yeah. know, because you talked of the pneumococcal vaccine. And you know, one of the things that Gavi does is we have a mechanism called the Advanced Market Commitment, and mm -hmm. we're able to negotiate with pharma you know, prices that are affordable uh, to poorer countries and accessible. So a dose now is about $2.95 oh. compared to about $100 in the, in the U.S. So you can see how, you know, countries can now afford to get these vaccines for their children. So that's a huge innovation in financing and accessibility. So I want to come back to this issue of vaccines because you take rotavirus vaccine, which elim eliminated uh, huge amounts of diarrheal disease, which is a massive killer of young people in the developing world. But it, there was as great a success story as that is, there was a delay in getting that drug out there because of fear of uh, very rare cases of intussusception, a reversible case. Uh, and, and, that, and so the West ended up removing it from their schedule of vaccinations and, and delaying that process of getting that drug out there. And I wonder, Bill, if, if, if there is sometimes a little bit of a deadly caution or, or, or are we, sl are we, what's slowing us down? I know as fast as we're moving, what would you change to, to make us go even faster? Well, I think it... <clears throat> We need to keep the industry R&D to be very high uh, while figuring out how this, these tiered pricing approaches uh, makes the access issue uh, a lot faster than it, it would be otherwise. In the case of vaccines, uh, Gabi is able to negotiate a very cost-oriented price so that for the 73 poorest countries, there's not recovery of the R&D or profit. That's gonna to have to come from the more middle income and rich countries. Um, in, in the example you gave, the only gold standard regulators are uh, rich country regulators, European uh, and US regulators. And because the deaths of, from diarrhea, or rotavirus in particular, are very, very low, the bar they set for our Rotashield side effects right. Uh, right. was extremely strict. And to keep the reputation of vaccines as being beneficial and not having uh, refusals that is a challenge even in, in rich countries, the quality of that regulation, uh, you know, I, I take no issue with it at all. Mm -hmm. If the world was super rational, we would have accepted that there was some side effect because the death rate in uh, Africa and India from rotavirus was high enough. But there's really no way to say to those countries, oh, this is not good enough for the US right. because their death rate isn't very high. So we moved fairly quickly. We got discounted pricing from uh, GSK and Merck. Over time, uh, we brought in uh, an Indian manufacturer at an even lower price. So it's pretty much a, a good news story. We have about 80% coverage uh, that's one of Gabi's uh, focus uh, for its next five-year period is going to be taking that coverage where we have parts of Africa, Nigeria being uh, one of our uh, uh, particular difficulties in getting, in getting that up. But right now, the, the system of regulation, the idea of recovering your uh, cost and getting your profit off of the, the middle-income and rich countries, that's working pretty well. Um, in addition, so this, yeah, sorry, I was please. just going to say that in addition to the regulatory issue, though, and I would agree with Bill there, um, there is a degree of uh, lag which I think we collectively have to address, which is the speed at which treatment guidelines get changed all the way through to um, national level, and then how physician practicing prescribing behavior changes. This can be, this can take years. Um, and um, how we can work together to, f to get 
the best new biomedical interventions to patients quicker, I think is, is, is a challenge for all of us. So which one of you wants to get the hate mail? Because I'm about to bring up the anti-vaxxer uh, movement. But um, this is, I mean, this is a real challenge. We've seen, you know, a backsliding of polio cases, uh, some fear in Nigeria, and goes to your, your home country where you were the health minister twice. Um, finance minister. And finance, finance minister. I wouldn't dare to be a Two finance minister, minister and, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, finance minister twice, and also uh, 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 the, uh, your of foreign affairs that were the yeah, chief diplomat. Um, but, um, but so we've seen that. We've seen a backslide of measles and, and, and rubella in the, in the West. I mean, it's kind of scary. And this is, you know, this is one of the, the we've talked a lot over the this last couple of days about trust. Um, you know, fundamental to the global health it, uh, effort is the, the belief that the vaccines and the other uh, you know, tools of, inst uh, of the international health movement are, are safe and effective. Uh, how do you deal with that? Well, or Tedros, if you want to think too. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe I can start. I mean, you know, I have to say that uh, when you look at the landscape, there's really been a high degree of trust mm -hmm. and deliverability in the vaccines we've had in the world. Actually, it's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, so we, we have to stress that. But we also have to look at cultural issues, at fears, mm -hmm. you know, at false information that comes in and people get afraid. So there are all sorts of issues. And I think working through the local community um, uh, has been essential, both for the alliance, but the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Bill was talking about Nigeria, has also done excellent work on the ground, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the case of uh, polio, for instance, um, you know, to try to break down some of those cultural barriers and have the local imams, you know, the community leaders mm -hmm. to talk to people and reassure them. I know there was a time we even had to have vaccines brought in from Indonesia, you know, to, because, uh, you know, to make sure that people had trust that it mm -hmm. came from uh, an, an Islamic country and everything was, you know, all right. Um, so, but I don't think we should exaggerate those. There's a lot of trust in the system yeah. and we should not allow people to undermine okay. that. So, yeah. Sonia, I know you wanted to jump in on this. Yes, I think the trust issue that you just mentioned is part of a much bigger problem because when you talk about global health and its sustainability and the way forward, we have to appreciate that today we are living in a world where, uh, you know, the value of international institutions and the trust in multilateral system is wavering. Um, we are, in fact, seeing a scenario where many of the cross-cutting agendas, such as family planning and reproductive health and sexual health, are, you know, the, the value of investment in them is being contested. And Peter Sands just reiterated the wide-ranging ramifications of that, of the, of that setback. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, I think, paradoxically, there has never been such a time where the value of international institutions and the imperative to invest in them has been more imperative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can go on and on with a list of things. For instance, relevant to the health sector, there are three risks that threaten to wipe out the development gains of the last century. Pandemics, antibiotic resistance, non-communicable diseases. Tedros will tell you that universal health coverage is his top priority and the top priority of many countries where, uh, and, and for very good reasons. But, mm -hmm. but in order to institutionalize universal health coverage, you have to play health with a very different stack of cards. You have to engage the private sector in many different uh, ways. Um, our colleague here will tell you that precision medicine is likely to become the default option very soon because mm -hmm. of a number of different transformations. And you know, there's this whole technology piece and how uh, institutions outside of the healthcare system are taking the lead on um, providing solutions for universal health coverage. These are institution, financial institutions and online retail actors. And in order to institutionalize and reap the benefits of all these transformations, you new, need new standards, new rules, you need workforce realignment, you need stepping up uh, and change in regulatory capacity. And you essentially need change in stepping up of capacity and and all that is not going to happen if we will not invest in uh, international institutions in the multilateral system, which are consistently under attack. Yeah. So, so this whole question about 
which country is going to take a lead uh, in raising its voice and becoming the world's conscience? Mm -hmm. uh, and which country has the, the fiscal strength, the fiscal ability, the credibility, and the spine to raise the voice are becoming hugely important in this discourse, not just of uh, around global financing for health, but also mm -hmm. global development financing. And I think these are big ticket things around which there needs to be a dedicated discourse. Mm -hmm. Us. Yeah, I wanted to, to, to pick up on this point on as we evolve into precision medicine and looking at all the advances. I mean, it's quite striking to me when, when you think about the conversation here, Gavi Global Fund. 20 years ago, we knew that infectious disease was where we had the biggest potential for significant impact. We set up the Global Fund, um, you know, Bill set up Gavi. We've had tremendous impact and we need to continue to fund those institutions. But if you go to a typical West African country, even with a well-run healthcare system, you look at the burden of hypertension, you look at the capacity for basic dialysis mm -hmm. and basic medical interventions to manage hypertension or manage any of the consequences of hypertension, much less diabetes or obesity. I see systems that will soon collapse. I mean, I think this is gonna be a significant issue. And I ask myself, do we need a global fund for non-communicable disease or do we need some other mechanism? Because even if we raise the 16 billion for the global fund and we tackle AIDS, TB and malaria, it'll help for the next 10 years. But 20 years from now, we sit in a very different problem. And far, you know, we're still very far from bringing things like precision me medicine, gene therapies, et cetera, to, to solve these but problems. But that's a great point. I mean, Bill, um, you know, do we need new financing mechanisms beyond the, uh, the multilateral groups that, that we've talked about today? You know, obviously the Global Fund and Gavi and the Polio uh, Eradication Initiative um, and the, um, the effort for, for maternal and, and child health, the, uh, the uh, financing facility. Um, those are critical, but for things like dealing with or the challenge of antibiotic resistance or for vaccines for, for ailments where there isn't a, a large market, should there be another financing mechanism, a model uh, that, that can help do what the, uh, what the, uh, the market initiative did for vaccines? You know, think about it in a different way. Well, I'm sure every panel at WEF uh, <laughs> wants to find some new magic funding source for their particular <laughs> cause. Uh, and if somebody finds that, I'm uh, all for it. Uh, I think realistically, the overseas development aid uh, will not be going up uh, very substantially. And in fact, if we don't bring back the track record of global health and really get that story out there, we run the risk uh, with so many distractions, including a sort of uh, more turning inward type framework, we could have less money. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, we talked, you know, Global Fund could spend 16 billion and, you know, Peter and I uh, met and, you know, I said, hey, let's set the goal at 14 billion because I think It'll be a challenge to raise 14 billion. Uh, if we go beyond that, uh, I'll buy him a drink uh, <laughs> uh, and we'll celebrate. Uh, I, I will say that I was wrong. Uh, but it's the, the uh, getting this message out, these are issues that are very far away and the slightest mistake that gets made, you know, some money goes to a training session that never took place and so that's corrupt. Even if it's 1% of the money, that gets a headline, whereas the 99% sure. that's saving millions of lives doesn't. So we, you know, we're not in a position to afford very expensive interventions. There are some non-communicable um, diseases like cervical cancer, uh, you know, lung cancer. You know, you can do lots of things to tax tobacco, cut it down. Hypertension is a great example where the drugs are now cheap enough Mm -hmm. uh, it's cheap to measure blood pressure. Those blood pressure medicines have been long off patent. Uh, you know, so we, we're funding an organization that's now gonna help get some of those interventions out there. So we always need to see when something comes down and it's practical. But you know, the, when people talk about precision medicine, the US can't afford precision medicine. So I dare <laughs> anybody else uh, right. to try. Uh, it, there's many definitions of that, if it, but if it means <laughs> Designing drugs for very, very small patient groups, i.e. N equals one, it's, 
it's not in the cards. You know, we need to, to deal with diabetes and obesity and Alzheimer's uh, in rich countries and then bring those costs down. Eventually, gene therapy, I do think, will come into a form uh, that can be delivered in developing countries. But first, we have to get it into the rich countries. And then, you know, for sickle cell, HIV cure, uh, and in the upstream area, it's, it's super exciting, but it'll, it'll take quite a bit of time. Yeah. Um, talking about um, financing is important. Of course, we will need resources, but uh, we need to ask another question. Are we really doing the right investments? Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, our colleague said hypertension and maybe diabetes or cardiovascular, you name it, the non-communicable diseases. Many of them are linked with risks. And this, our central strategy should actually be to address those risks. Alcohol, smoking, dietary issues, inactivity, then obesity comes in all colors and forms. Um, so really talking about the investment we're doing, whether it's the right one or not, is important. And that leads me to the right investment that we should uh, do uh, globally, and this is primary health care. Its investment is actually low, but its return is, is high. And we should go back to the basics and focus on health promotion and this prevention. And we need to really invest in that. Be it for communicable diseases or non-communicable diseases, the response or the vehicle is primary health care. And now we are partnering with Gates Foundation and to give focus on primary health care as part of the universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. Universal health coverage as a rights issue, an end in itself, and also a means to development because no country actually can prosper without um, healthy society. <laughs> it's a smart mm -hmm. investment, but within that, investment in primary health care can actually be quick. Right. Many countries have, have, have done it. You're, so the smart and the right investment, mm. I think, has to be discussed in addition to the yeah. uh, financing. You know, one reflection I have is, you know, we've been talking, I think, in global health about primary health care and primary health care for all for, for, for decades. And I think actually we've made a lot of progress. But I also wonder in, in the topic about financing, how do we finance disruptive ideas? How do we finance you know, entrepreneurs? Because one thing I've, I've noted in our own activities is there is a pretty healthy growth of startups that are really trying to tackle these ideas in very disruptive ways. And typically, we take ODA funds and we channel them through the traditional paths, and may, maybe that is the right answer. But I wonder how much more we might be able to catalyze if we start to support those, those entrepreneurs. And there's good examples, I mean, well-known, I think things like the, the well-known zip line example in blood transfusion, or we are, we are supporting a number in Africa. But I'm quite struck by the fact that these disruptive ideas to try to get around what seems to be quite significant constraints locally might be something to look at, sort of feeding that micro environment along with doing the big top-down push for, for primary care. Yeah. One of yeah. the disruptive, I would like to yeah. say, I would like to answer that question. One of the most disruptive is political commitment. Mm -hmm. Political intervention is surgical intervention. Countries who have committed politically and allocated domestic resources and who considered external support as catalytic mm -hmm. support can move a long, long way. Mm -hmm. So it's not an economic argument, actually, in many countries. It is, of course, but it's more of a political Mm -hmm. Because there are many countries when, when they have even the resources who can't do it. Mm -hmm. And when you see countries who have done it, they have started it actually when their economy is in shambles. Like the UK, for instance, immediately after the Second World War, when Lord Beveridge designed and the NHS started. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, that could be disruptive, the political commitment. Mm -hmm. But not only mobilizing domestic resources, when there is political commitment to health for all or universal health coverage, it can also have disruptive ideas to involve the private sector to do its share to make it happen. 
Yeah, yeah I just, um, I wanted to say something, being a former finance minister about domestic resources. But before that, I want to let you know that Gavi indeed has a fund of which uh, uh, the, the Gates Foundation uh, matches and a program called Infuse, where we encourage uh, innovators, including local ones, to come up with ideas that are disruptive, that can really help us tackle some of the central challenges we face, such as reaching the children who are hard to reach. We've done the easy work now, and we are sort of stagnating around 80% in terms mm -hmm. of immunization. How do we get past that? How do we reach that difficult to reach child in remote areas, in conflict affected areas? And so, so we, we have that program. So if you want to do I'll work more with us, check it, check it out. <laughs> the, 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 the big point I want to make though is we, Bill said something about, um, about aid is not going to be so much available. We want to encourage, yes, uh, more resources. Gavi will be going into its replenishment. I don't want to say a number here. We're still working on it, but whatever, we will need it. However, I also want us to focus on domestic resources, Dr. Tedros mentioned. We have an, you know, our program in Gavi encourages countries. Every country, no matter how poor, must contribute to its immunization program. Mm -hmm. So, and over time, as the countries get more and more uh, well off, they contribute more and more down the line because we want to work ourselves out of a job. Yeah. That's it. We want countries to graduate and take over. You know, so, so helping them to mobilize more of their own resources so that we can be sure of the sustainability of the is also a key. So as we work on the aid side, we also need to work on raising demand. And it's, it's, it's hard. We talk of domestic resource mobilization. It's become almost a slogan, you know, mm -hmm. to answer all questions. But as a former finance minister who actually tried to do it in my own country where the tax to GDP ratio is very low, particularly after we rebased the economy, we hadn't done it for 24 years, and we more than doubled our GDP. You can yeah. imagine what happened to all the ratios. Then trying to strengthen tax administration, you know, so you can close loopholes and get the expertise you need to allow people not to uh, escape from, from paying their taxes. You know, tr trying to uh, reset tax policy, trying to bring more into the tax net to mm -hmm. broaden your base, because we have a lot of informality in our economies. This is a huge task. I know that uh, it's not a health task only, you know, so in our alliance, we've got the World Bank, we've got, you know, so we have to also partner with people who are not directly health in order to make some of the financing work. But Peter, you know, Ngozi just makes a really good point. This isn't as AIDS so much as it is investment. Um, investment in one's own country, investment in the world. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates have often used the, uh, the expression that you've gotten a 20 times return on your investment uh, with the money you've invested so far. I don't want to quote you if that's wrong, but, yep. uh, but Peter, I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you make the investment case to the donors, since you're going to be going out there uh, with the very uh, rich uh, tin cup? Uh, yeah, it's, it is true that the returns on investment in global health are incredibly high. Um, I think we were more conservative in our investment case. We said one to 19, so you get 19 back for every, you know, that's, but, you know, as a ex- Banker, I used to think that getting 1.2 to 1 was um, a really good return. So the idea of getting 19 to 1 um, is pretty extraordinary. Now, of course, the real issue here is that the people who pay the money don't get the 19, um, and that the, the returns are much broader um, in society. But they are so huge that really you can tell a compelling case, and also, these infectious diseases aren't static. Um, there is no kind of middle ground. You are either winning against them or they are beating you. And the economics of being on the back foot against AIDS, TB, and malaria, or the, the diseases that you get hit by vaccines, you know, these are terrible um, uh, economics. Um, the point about disruption, I think, is a really interesting one. And we tend to think about disruption in terms of sort of medical innovations and so on. But also, I think a thing that is going on, and I give 
others on this panel credit for this, is that we're getting a lot of disruption and innovation in terms of delivery models of different ways of um, reaching um, or organizing programs, whether it's zero TB, cities, or other sorts of program like that. But we're also breaking down um, silos. I think through the Global Action Plan, there's been a huge amount of often painful discussion between all the multilateral entities um, about how do we work together better. And uh, certainly between Gavi and the Global Fund, there is now an intense dialogue on every single aspect of what we do, through, from boring administrative things like our shared cafeteria and building and cybersecurity to shared programming um, in the field. And I think breaking down those silos, and they, and they also occur in the clinical profession. I mean, we should have much closer integration between um, HIV treatment and TB treatment. Mm -hmm. But we run into professional silos because these people are in the National TB program and these people are in the National AIDS program. And we've got, we've, we've got to force these things. Um, one, one dichotomy that always irritates me um, is, the, is people talking about sort of vertical or horizontal as if they're sort of in opposition. So uh, in some people's view, the Global Fund and indeed Gavi are the archetypal vertical interventions, disease focused, not caring about the system, just focused on the disease, or you have um, horizontal interventions building the healthcare system. I mean, the reality is you will never get rid of one of these diseases unless you build a system. And a system that isn't coping with these diseases mm -hmm. isn't really a very effective system. So you need to do both. And actually, a, a big chunk of global fund programming is actually spent on health systems. We spend about a billion dollars a year on health systems, which actually makes us the largest multilateral provider of grants for health systems. So I think we, we, need, to, we need to be prepared to challenge a lot of these kind of paradigms of it's vertical or horizontal or it's you know, these particular silos of activity. Because that's not what patients care about. Right. Peter, as a banker, do you, do you think social impact bonds are going to lead to a, a big shift over time in, in financing? Uh, I'm afraid to say my many years as a banker have made me actually quite skeptical about a lot of financial innovation. Um, financial innovation is brilliant at reassigning risks, changing the timing profile, or changing incentives. It is not a magic money machine. Um, it doesn't create some unknown you yeah. know, pool of resources. And if you look at what happened with Gavi and the Global Fund, what you had was a pooling of resources, a way of changing incentives with IFIM, a changing of the timing profile of the money to make it more optimized. So you can attract more money um, because it has greater impact, but the fundamental thing that innovative finance does is give you greater impact. And so, I, I don't want to sound too dismissive. Social impact bonds have their role, but let's not kid ourselves that there are some sort of wonderful silver bullet -y type things um, out there that are going to transform the fundamental challenges we've got. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say a quick word on IFIM, the International Finance Facility for Immunization which is an instrument for raising resources that Peter alluded to. Um, I think the key issue we need to think about is what does it do? We, we are about saving lives. So if we can find a way of getting resources faster, sooner, to yeah. save more lives, that could be, that's a very valid objective. Yeah. So what this instrument does is with the securitization of aid. So instead of being given five million or 10 million every year, you say, look, we have these resources, we know we are coming, we can securitize this and front load. So this instrument, we go to the market and we actually raise resources on the capital market to be repaid later. What does it allow us to do? We can save more lives faster, sooner. So I think financial innovation, where we need a sense of urgency, can be very, very important. And we've raised $6.5 billion so far, including even a Sukuk bond recently, a Sharia compliant bond. So I think there's a, uh, there's a very firm place for some of these instruments. Yeah, we've been using these mechanisms to, uh, to fund, to finance uh, bridges and tunnels. Uh, so Sonia, what, 
Kochi. Three quick reflections on yeah. what's being discussed. Firstly, you know, this conversation is veering towards the importance of the global funds, the infectious disease funds, and I think that there they, they are no two opinions about it. They've been enormously held, enormously impactful. They need to be supported. Uh, but the reality of the matter is that conversations about graduation and transition are always happening, uh, are mm -hmm. already happening, and they're already and they're also happening at the country level. So it is important within that context to ascertain where the financial vulnerabilities are mm -hmm. and to be very clear about creating the transition frameworks well ahead of time. Because even if we're looking at a five-year horizon, uh, we should be prepared with the transition frameworks. We should be prepared with very explicit and predictable co-financing arrangements uh, because these need to be sorted out ahead of time. Secondly, there's this conversation about non-communicable diseases. I don't think that there is an appetite for a new global fund-like initiative for NCDs. We all know that. But I think when we talk about a new financing instrument and a new architecture for non-communicable diseases, for which there is ample justification, we may be talking about an explicit integration mandate, because that exists at several points. Uh, across the whole spectrum of health systems mm -hmm. and global health institutions. For, for example, at a country level, non-communicable disease medi medicines should, can be included into national essential drug lists. The several waves of surveys that USAID, that uh, the UNICEF and that the World Bank supports at a population-based level could integrate modules for NCDs. That, that does not necessitate mm -hmm. creating vertical structures. For instance, uh, PEPFAR and the Global Fund for ATB and Malaria have done remarkably well in terms of creating primary health care systems for chronic care. And you yeah. layer this up with the online capabilities that retail institutions and the banking systems are creating, uh, and there's a perfect justification for including NCDs in that mix. So we, we do not have to create uh, a, a global fund worth X billion and with 400 staff in Geneva. They, 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 the NCD piece could be addressed, number one, with an explicit integration mandate. Uh, and financing instruments around that. And of course, as Ted was mentioned, uh, there is this whole other piece about the whole of government approach uh, mm -hmm. around tobacco, food systems, physical activity, alcohol, which needs to be mobilized through different instruments, which are not in resource intensive. Paradoxically, they can generate resources yep. for prevention activities through EMR levies, as, as we all know. Uh, and just a, a 30 second response, I cannot resist to what uh, Nicosi, you said. I think tax uh, can be one of the most important uh, innovative instruments, because we talk about de debt swaps and we talk about bonds and the rest, the rest of it. But we have to realize from a country vantage point that uh, anti-tax evasion efforts, anti-money lo money laundering efforts, and anti-corruption efforts uh, have perfect synergy. Uh, because uh, because the monies that are whisked away by tax evasion, on the one hand, are used for money laundering and terrorist financing. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, they take away uh, the, the money that is needed to invest in human capital it, investment. So it, I think... This we, is my favourite bit of innovative finance for how <laughs> 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 The basic tax blocking and tack right. tackling to have good tax design and collection. Right. I think... Absolutely right. I just had a, a quick point. I mean, one thing I reflect on is one of the things on the global fund that focused the mind on AIDS, TB, and malaria. And every time I hear the word non-communicable diseases, I think that's a lot of diseases. Right? And I wonder, it's hypertension, diabetes, and COPD, or whatever the, uh, the University of Washington quality list would tell us. Mm -hmm. Maybe that helps focus the mind. Because I think right now, the, it just seems like such an insurmountable task when we say non-communicable disease. It'd be like if you are the global fund of communicable disease, I think you'd have a harder time raising, raising money. So what, what else also focuses the mind is the, is the fear of backsliding. Peter, you mentioned that a little bit, and Bill, I know you've, you've mentioned that. Uh, where are we most in danger? Where do you see as the sort of critical places where if we don't move forward, we're going to move back? And also, can we just talk a little bit about the demographics, uh, the, the very young cohort uh, in Africa and in much of the developing world, and, and how dangerous that is when you get a uh, communicable disease uh, framework? Well, the you know, economic development in Asia, in general, has been strong enough that the really 
the best stories of graduation where they'll be able to maintain the health systems uh, are countries like India, Indonesia, Vietnam. Plenty of challenges there, but overall, those are really good stories. Uh, Africa's you know, challenging, and Nigeria is graduating uh, from Gabi. That's been lengthened out, which was a, a really great move that Gabi made. Uh, that was sort of a quid pro quo to go to the country and say, okay, we're gonna smooth this thing out over a 10-year period instead of a five-year period if you step up to your part. And so uh, you know, there's ongoing work to make sure that that, uh, that goes very well. I do think the consensus around global health is, is fragile because um, you know, we've had some enlightened politicians who've believed in these causes. You know, we had President Bush who started PEPFAR and, and got the US into Global Fund. Um, you know, we had increases in uh, the UK aid levels, the German aid levels. But if you, if you look at the awareness of what's been achieved here, people may be more aware about the uh, criticisms than they are about the success. So mm -hmm. getting a good news story out is very hard when it's a very far away thing and there's a bunch of acronyms. Uh, even the diseases, you know, people, uh, you know, we assume that they live it like all of us on the panel do, and that can make it uh, less of a story. And yet, you know, if we do it right, it is a very strong story. But we don't have broad voter awareness that locks in the, even the current level of generosity. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, on as um, the, one thing to add uh, to what Bill said, I think uh, it will be important uh, to invest on alignment of the SDG, I mean the global health players. Uh, we have signed 11 agencies, uh, including Global Fund, uh, Gavi, and, and others, uh, and we have an SDG action plan now to align, accelerate, and also account. And this will help us to align not only at the global level, but as Peter said, to align at the country level. Mm -hmm. So that can have better impact, actually, when we align, and based on the country's priorities, of course. Um, that's one. And second, we're doing replenishments for Global Fund, for Gavi, and so on. We need to have a united voice on that. Mm -hmm. What do we need in terms of uh, resources for global health together? And then how do we uh, mobilize it with united voice would, would really help, even to convince uh, the donors and, 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 and so on. So this is just uh, what I would like. And then uh, I fully agree. Uh, we have many stories which we don't really tell, and we have to tell our stories. And we should tell to the taxpayers through, uh, you know, uh, active uh, media campaign what their money is actually doing in the lives of uh, millions and what has changed, as you have shown, um, in the last 20 years. Thank mm -hmm. you. Peter, you've got 20 seconds to make your elevator pitch to the world governments. <laughs> We can end the three biggest infectious disease epidemics in the world if we want to. Why wouldn't we? And with that, <laughs> I want to thank our panelists, Peter Sands, Sonia Nishtar, Vasna Simham, and, and Gozi Okanja Iriala, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, and Bill Gates. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We have a couple of people still coming uh, in the doors, and uh, welcome to Good morning, everybody. I know we have a couple of people still coming. Good morning, everybody. I know we have a couple of people still coming uh, in the doors, and uh, welcome to the World Economic Forum. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, so early. Uh, as we kick off uh, this, uh, this Davos. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin of The New York Times and CNBC. Uh, we have a remarkable conversation 
that I hope we're going to have over the next hour, and we're going to bring you all into this conversation, really about the new architecture, the new market dynamics with which I think we're all living uh, and uh, trying to grapple with. And those things involve everything from the idea of scale, the idea that every business, every uh, person I imagine involved in business in this room is always thinking about how they can be bigger. And what does bigness mean? Is bigness good? Um, Google provides us all sorts of uh, different uh, search, uh, search options and video and all sorts of things. And Brian Moynihan at Bank of America, I can use my ATM machine and uh, get money uh, in all sorts of ways around the world. And um, well, Steve, all over the world. So we can, we can go all over, all over the world with everybody. Uh, so there are benefits of scale, clearly, uh, but there are also downsides. And we will talk about all of that. And we're also going to talk about the global economy and where we are in a world where we keep trying to expand and become more global at a time where maybe that's becoming a little bit more complicated. Um, and we will have that conversation. Uh, here, who is with us uh, today, we have a remarkable group. Brian Moynihan uh, from Bank of America is the CEO uh, of that company. Uh, Raghu uh, Rajan is here. Uh, he is the former research director at the IMF, uh, former governor uh, of the Reserve Bank of India, and now a professor uh, at, uh, of finance at the Chicago Booth uh, School of Business in Chicago. Um, Ning Gao is here. He's the chairman of Sinochem, uh, one of the four largest uh, chemical agricultural companies uh, in China, and uh, can speak specifically to the idea of scale, given your size. Uh, Steve Schwartzman is here, chairman uh, and CEO, co-founder uh, of Blackstone, and um, Ruth Porat. Um, you now have many titles, but uh, we'll call you SVP and CFO of Alphabet, uh, better known for many of us as Google. Um, thank you all for being here. I I'm going to go Raghu for, uh, first because I know you have thought a lot about this idea of scale. You've written a book that's coming out uh, about competition and where we are in this world. And you have actually perhaps a more balanced view of this than people might think in that I think you have thought about the good sides of scale but also the other side of scale. And I thought you could maybe, maybe start this conversation. Um, and I'd start with this. At a time when there seems to be hand-wringing in the United States and Europe, maybe less so in China, and we'll talk about that, um, is the hand-wringing politically on both sides, and by the way, you get it on, on every side, is it right? Meaning, meaning is, the, is there too, too little competition or too much? Okay. Uh, well, um, I guess I'm supposed to maintain the balance on this panel. That's why I'm not wearing a tie. Uh, other than Ruth, of course. Um, look, the, uh, today we benefit tremendously from scale. Uh, there are scale economies which are passed through to the customer in many ways. Um, there are uh, benefits of efficiency in these global corporations that we see on this panel. Uh, and that's all to the good. Uh, I mean, uh, Google